In his famous Mount Olivet prophecy, and later on combined with what the revelation of Jesus Christ, that's what the title of the book actually is, we find that Jesus, or Yeshua, as I'll say throughout, as his Hebrew name was, often talked about the coming time of great deception, even greater than we see today. And Yeshua asked a question that I think we all want to ask ourselves. Will you be deceived at the very end time? Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25, let's read it. Matthew 24, 23 to 25, If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very or even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So he says, I want you to know this is going to happen. So those of you who are alive at the very end time, if possible, even the elect will be deceived. If possible, will you be deceived at the end time? Welcome, everyone, to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of, of uh, Light on the Rock. I'm your brother in Christ, serving you with these free messages from our free website. I hope you'll go often and check the video sermons as well as the audio sermons, two different lineup. Um, some are just plain audio, some have the video with it, like this one. And then also, if you're watching this on the audio portion, make sure you go back and watch it on video. And then also we have blogs that are short articles, and we literally have hundreds and hundreds of blogs and hundreds of sermons, and you can even search, uh, use a search bar to see if a topic that you're interested in is in there. Or you can also just go back by year, and maybe we can show that sometime. You can go back by year and uh, see what the list is. So will it be possible for the adversary, for Satan, to, to deceive you and me? The coming great false prophets and the Antichrist will be so convincing, especially in the end time, because they'll have such great signs and such great wonders that even the elect are thinking, what, what's going on here? This, this, i got to think about this. Are these false prophets, or is this the great false prophet, or is this someone else? So I'm going to read today, in today's sermon, I want to read the uh, scriptures about that great deception at the end. It may have been a while since some of you have read it, in Revelation in particular, in 2 Thessalonians and other places. And then the next sermon, I'm going to get into how to make sure we don't ever get deceived. How to be sure, because I was just... Uh, reading in, I think it's Revelation uh, 15, uh, Revelation 15, or the end of 14, that those who have the mark of the beast are going to suffer the wrath of God. And it goes on in detail what happens to them. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be part of any false system. But that will mean that if we're not in some place of protection, that will mean that you and I will probably be killed. Or, or persecuted terribly before that. And we have to be willing to go through that. But anyway, some will be protected. I, I really believe that too. So uh, Jesus said, if possible, even the elect. Well, who are the elect? Later on in Matthew 24, Yeshua says, the angels will gather the elect of God from the four corners of the, of the world and bring them up to him in the clouds. Then we shall live forever be with him. 1 Thessalonians adds, So the elect are God's people who are counted worthy to be in that first resurrection and to be with Christ gathered there by the angels. Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 12, Therefore as elect of God, as elect of God, holy, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, as elect of God. So where are the elect? The church People who are filled with the Holy Spirit. I am not considering any corporate body to be the church. I just am not. There are people who have God's Spirit in many different corporate bodies, even some corporate bodies who won't speak to each other. At least the official stance seems to be that. Even though Yeshua said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples for this incredible agape love that you have for each other. The kind of love I gave as you love one another as I have loved you. John 13, verse 34 and 35. 
So if you don't want to be deceived by a very, very deceptive coming of the prophets, uh, you stand your best chance, of course, by being part of the elect, apparently. The elect are the beloved, spirit-filled children of God. It comes from the Greek word eklektos. Eklektos, meaning those who are specially chosen, selected, handpicked by God himself long ago. So will you be deceived? Can you be deceived? I think the answer to that is going to be a yes and no. That depends on several things. Depends, first of all, if you're even the elect or not. Um, but anyway, so we'll, we'll go through that in much more detail in part two. The first time the Bible ever talks about a particular word or brings up a word like love or whatever that word is that we're talking about, covenant, love, other words that are the first time it's used, it's very telling, very instructive sometimes. And so uh, in the case of the word deceive or deceived, uh, the first time it is used in the Bible is in Genesis 3, verse 13. By this time, Adam and Eve have taken of the forbidden fruit. By this time, they had blamed each other. Kind of jumping ahead here a little bit, but God had come to Adam and, what have you done? Well, this woman, I never asked for her. You gave me this woman. The woman made me do it. <laughs> you know, she, he blames the woman just like that. What's that song um, anyway about the, uh, uh, I like to blame the woman, but anyway. Uh, and so the woman, why did you do this woman? Uh, he says to Eve, and Eve says, the serpent, Genesis 3, 13, the serpent deceived me. First time it is in the Bible. The serpent deceived me and I ate. And then he went to the serpent. What have you done? And since the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, he just sat there. Anyway, so she told Adam and Eve, pass the buck. So she told the truth. She told the truth to God. She told the truth to the serpent. Uh, Satan, by the way, is not mentioned at all in Genesis 3. In fact, Satan's not mentioned much in the Old Testament at all, except 18 times, most of them, 14 times I think it is, in the book of Job, and three times in the book of Zechariah, and once in, I think it's Second or First Chronicles. Nowhere in Genesis is the serpent identified. But the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, we're told who the serpent is. Revelation 12, verse 9. He's also called a dragon here. I warn you people, especially in China and Asia, who have dragon parades and thing, things, don't, if God's calling you, get out of having anything to do with the dragon. Just stop. Don't do it. You may want to hear my sermons about demons. Just put in demon or demons uh, in the search bar and they'll come up. Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil, which means slanderer, and Satan, which means enemy, adversary, who deceives everyone, the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. In the first earlier verses of Revelation 12, in verses 3 and 4, this dragon is described as having seven heads and ten horns. Now, any of you who are playing video games that you like that have to do with dragons and demons and things, stop it. In Jesus' name, stop it. It's not going to do you any, any good whatsoever. Just stop it. And you're opening the doors to things you don't want to be opening doors to. All right, sorry, I'm standing on my cord here. You don't want to have anything to do with games with has to do with demons and dragons. You don't want to be watching any Harry Potter movies, uh, books or shows. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. If you have any at home, burn them. Burn them t today. Get rid of them. Trash them out. Get rid of them. Don't give them away. They're, they're opening doors you don't want to have opened. Now, one big key to avoid being deceived is to know God's word and to know it very, very well. The, the truth shall set you free. I'll speak much more of that in the next sermon. But here's something I find very interesting. And I don't know if you've thought about this before, quite this way. Eve told the serpent the truth. Eve knew the truth. She got it either from Adam directly or may have gotten it from God himself 
as they walked, uh, you know, during the daytime uh, cools of cool time of the hour, cool cool time of the day. She told the serpent almost exactly what God had told Adam. What God had, uh, she inserted the the phrase or touch it. We're not allowed to even touch that tree. Uh, that's no, there's no mention of that from God. But I can, I don't see God. God could have said that to them later on or whatever. But in Genesis 3, verse 1, now the serpent, who we now know is the dragon, Satan, was more cunning than any beast of the field, which Jehovah God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Satan was cunning, the most cunning. He was subtle. He won their confidence. He got to chatting with them. The woman makes the mistake of chatting with the devil, whom she didn't know was the devil yet, probably. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, don't think for a second you're going to outwit Satan. There's no point in getting into conversation with him except to give back God's word and stop it with that. Yeshua had to face Satan. He had to defeat him. He had to have his one-on-one -on -one with him and defeat him. You and I, when we're being questioned, or God, uh, God is being questioned uh, by God-haters, we don't need to get into the conversation necessarily. So the first mistake was conversing with somebody questioning God's rules. Don't do that. It's, it, it was Satan's very cunning, very smart. In fact, in Ezekiel 28, where it addresses it as a, to the king of Tyre, but it wasn't the king of Tyre. Uh, he was just a type of who they were talking about because it says uh, this, this, this being in Ezekiel 28 was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in the garden of Eden. You were the anointed cherub who covers before God threw him out after he rebelled. So he was full of wisdom. The guy's smart. Don't fool around with him. Yeshua says in John 8, that he's the father of all liars. Lying's a big deal. Don't allow yourself to get into the habit of lying just because it's more convenient. Lying makes you a part of Satan. Yeshua said that himself. He said to the people who were opposing him, you are of your father, the devil. He likes to lie. He's lied from the beginning. There's no truth in him. Some of you are in the habit of lying. Little lies. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. That's of Satan. Again, Adam was not deceived. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 to 14 says that. I'm not going to bother reading that. You can go back and read it. 1 Timothy 2 11 to 14 or I might read it later. Only Adam had been given God's command in the beginning because when God first gave the command, remember in Genesis 2, God created Adam outside the garden. A lot of people think he's created in the garden. No, he wasn't. He was created outside the garden and then later on put into the garden. You can read that in Genesis 2. And the one who created him was called Yehovah. And yet we know that God the Father created all things through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3.9, I think, is the verse for that. It's not in my notes here. Ephesians 3.9, John 1, verses 1 to 3, Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Everything that's been created, Colossians 1, verses 15 to 18, everything created was created by the one we know as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word. So the one who knelt down in the dust and the sand and the dirt and the and, you know, dust and, and, and made it into a man was the one we know as Jesus Christ, as Yeshua. The Word of God. And he taught him and trained him and, and told him about the, the two trees. Eve hadn't been created yet. That happens at the end of Genesis 2. And so I'm sure that Adam told Eve. I'm sure God later on told them both again, reminded them. Anyway, you go back to Genesis 3, verse 4. And then the serpent lied, said <laughs> to woman, whenever he's talking, he's, he's lying. He says, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, in fact, and you'll be like him, like God, knowing good and evil. God's holding back stuff from you. I suspect, I, I, I just believe that it's possible that Satan was just munching on that forbidden fruit. 
I'm not dying. I'm eating it. See? And I suspect because Christ was the second Adam. So there are types and anti-types. So Christ was given a very similar test about eating and, and, and so forth after he was very, very hungry. I suspect that Eve and Adam were probably hungry. So it's easier. Uh, so anyway, you will not surely die. God knows. Okay, I read that. It's easier to be deceived if something is appealing to you. We can end up deceiving ourselves that something's all right when it's deadly, if we're not on our guard. I'll talk more about that much more later on. But, you know, this is what Satan's saying. Look, hey, I'm, you're not going to die. So when the woman saw, and you want to compare this to 1 John 2, 16, but first we'll read Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, how would you know it's good for food? Unless you just believed what he said. I think he was probably eating some right there. Yeah, it's delicious, mm, munchy, crunchy. That it was pleasant to the eyes. I've seen these drawings in children's books of the tree of life, a beautiful tree, and tree of knowledge of good and evil, an old gnarled up tree with no leaves. No, no, it was pleasant to the eyes. It was a beautiful tree and a tree desirable to make one wise that appealed to her vanity. She ate of the fruit and she took the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her. A lot of people don't realize Adam was there with her and he ate. Adam is saying nothing so far. He should have told the serpent, I don't know who you are, but get out of here. He should have prayed, uh, God in heaven, I need your help. There's someone here. I, I don't know what he's doing here. Eve, get away. Get away right now. That's what he should have done. And he did not. Because our, 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 uh, our husband-to-be, Yeshua, he defends us. He's our advocate. He stands in there. He guards us. He fights. Where was Adam here? Maybe he was afraid the woman would complain about something. I don't know. Maybe they'd had a fight over who was in charge of things. I don't know. Anyway, the Apostle John defines the process to sin in 1 John 2, 16. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's when she saw it was good for food, the lust of the eyes, that the tree was beautiful to, to behold, and the pride of life, the tree was something that would make you wise, knowing good and evil, is of, is of the world, not of the Father. Okay, So that's what she did, lust of the flesh. When we sin, Satan will appeal to our lust of the flesh, whether it's food that we shouldn't eat or eat too much of, whether it's alcohol, whether it's forbidden kind of sex, other than with your wife or husband. And um, that's, that's sins of the flesh, greed and so on. Okay, uh, Satan used the same tactic with Yeshua after he'd been fasting 40 days, if you be the son of God. Come on, show me. Turn this uh, stone here into bread. Come on, big boy. Turn the stone into bread. And he left a key word out, by the way. We know the four temptations, or three temptations of, of Christ and Yeshua that are mentioned. There were many more, actually. Uh, was in Matthew chapter 4. But the very last verse of Matthew 3, after his baptism, Yeshua heard the voice from heaven, his father, saying, This is my beloved son. My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Satan comes along and says, well, if you're the son of God, and misses the word beloved. See, it's all, it's all very, very craftily done. We'll talk about that sometime. So lust of the eyes, pride of life, all of that was going on. And uh, so the lust of the flesh could be uh, fi you know, desiring booze, drugs, more sex. Sex is a big part of it. And lust of the eyes, coveting, coveting something you shouldn't have. Achan, after the battle of Jericho, coveted the gold, the silver, and the fine Babylonian garment. His whole family was killed because of that. So what happened here? Eve knew the truth. Eve had the truth. But she didn't stay with the truth. Warning, warning, red bells. If we don't stay with the truth and obey God, we also are opening the door to deception. So she didn't obey the truth. Okay, very important. Satan made Eve believe that in this instance, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. You're hungry. Food's right here. It's good food. You're not going to die. Look, I'm not dying. I suspect I, I'm putting a little bit of poetic license 
in there to uh, say that. I hope I don't lose my poetic license. Anyway, <laughs> the key, it's alarming how, it's alarming to me how quickly so many Americans, we have so many liberties in our country that other countries don't have, how quickly we were willing to give up key First Amendment rights out of our Constitution. We were told this thing is so terrible, so dangerous as COVID-19, that we have to exercise emergency powers. We have to lock down everybody. We have to quarantine everybody, including all those who are well. The Bible says quarantine the sick. But quarantine everybody, let everybody stay home. It's supposed to last 14 days. It's still going on. A year and a half later, it's still going on. So we were willing to, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, we can't have a state religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of people peaceably to assemble, and so on. But what happened? We were told you can't go to church, you can't assemble together, you can't sing, you can't chant, you can't speak in church. You can't go. People were arrested who tried. Oh, but let's open up and keep open the, uh, the, the um, marijuana stores, the liquor stores, the casinos. Let those stay open because those are essential services, but not churches. Nor restrict or prohibit the free exercise thereof, of, of your religion, freedom of speech. We were told it's an emergency situation. The governor, the president, whoever had a right to say these things. So we gave up. We just gave up. We didn't bother meeting together. We didn't bother doing those things. You'll see in part two how Peter handled that. Uh, so Eve gave up as well. Adam wasn't deceived, but went along to get along. I don't want to get in a big fight with Eve. I had one yesterday. Who knows? Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Sometimes we have to stand up for the truth. Adam should have said, stop it. Get out of here. God in heaven. Eve, get away. Okay, that's what he should have done. Back to Genesis 3, verse 7 now. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. How did they know they were naked then and not before? I suspect, I've said this before, again, the Bible doesn't say this, but whenever Moses and others, when Moses got in the very presence of God, he came down like a big, bright, shining light bulb. And so I suspect that since Adam and Eve had been in the presence of God quite often, that they too may have had that shining light about them. And when they sinned, it would be like turning off the switch to the lights around you. And boom, all of a sudden they could see their bodies of each other. Whereas before they were just big, bright, shining objects to each other. I think that's a possibility. I don't know. But otherwise, how do they suddenly know they're naked? They sewed fig leaves, made themselves covering. They heard the sound of God walking in the garden. God's calling out to them, and so on. <clears throat> so Eve knew the truth, but still got deceived. Okay, 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 to 14. Scripture clearly says Adam was not deceived, and yet he still went along. Let the woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But regardless, we know that Adam is still considered the first sinner. Romans 5.12, through one man, sin entered the world. Not one woman, through one man. Because he knew better and still did it. Eve knew better, but was deceived. Adam knew better and went along knowing it was wrong. So it's not enough to just know the truth. You have to obey God. So being uh, convinced, that, uh, beware of being convinced that it's okay this time not to obey God. It's okay this time to lie. You're protecting some people to have sex with someone who really needs it outside of marriage or whatever it is. It's okay to have that extra drink. You know you shouldn't. You're alcoholic or whatever don't be like Adam and go along to get along. Somehow he was not deceived and he still sinned. Most of us, probably all of us, dozens and dozens of times 
have sinned when we knew what we were about to do was wrong. Whether it's breaking the Sabbath or not tithing, or whether it's uh, not having Holy Day offerings the three times a year, or whether it's being unkind to your wife and not loving her as your Christ would, or not submitting to your husband, or all kinds of things, lusting, coveting, uh, using God's name in vain, all right? We've done things that we know are wrong. We, we've got to wake up to that. It's very, very serious. Now turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. We're going to read a bunch of scriptures about how deceptive this end-time false prophet, the great false prophet of the very end, is going to be so deceptive that he comes close to even deceiving the elect. I want you to be very aware of that. Satan himself will give him special miracles and signs that can't be explained away by just technology. He'll be so persuasive, in fact, that the world will adore him and worship him and worship the beast, worship the power behind the beast, which is Satan. So 2 Thessalonians 2, let's read the whole chapter, or most of the chapter. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Don't let anyone convince you that he's already come and it hasn't happened yet. Verse 3. I paraphrase that. Verse 3, let no, one des verse three. let no one deceive you by any means. Um, for that day, the day of the coming back of Christ, will not happen, will not happen, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits, get this, he sits as God, in the temple of God, showing himself to be God, that he is God. Do you remember that when I was still with you? I told you about all this, Paul, Paul said. And now you know what's restraining him uh, that may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness, anarchy, is already at work. Only he who restrains him will do so until he's taken away. In other words, there's something restraining this great false prophet from being revealed right now, he's ready to go. Or whenever the time comes, he'll be ready to go. And something or someone is holding him back. Verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. Working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception. Can you be deceived? All right, these are going to be such awesome miracles that you're going to say, wow, this can't just be a regular guy. All unrighteous deception among those who perish because, because they did not love the truth, receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, delusion that they should believe the lie, be deceived, in other words, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see what's going on? Workings of Satan. Satan will empower this lawless one, this antichrist. Satan will do it by having a powerful... Um, lying miracles. Someone's restraining him. And then verse 10, people are deceived because they didn't receive the love of the truth. Let's read another passage about the power so convincing. You'll, the, you know, world's kingdoms in the Bible are often described as beasts. So, for example, in Daniel 7, you may want to, I'm not going to read that right now, but Daniel 7 talks about beasts. And they're the kingdoms, they're kingdoms. And one is like a lion with wings in Daniel 7. One's like a bear with three ribs in its mouth. And one is like a leopard with four heads and four wings. And then there's the fourth ferocious beast. It's all there in Daniel 7. This, this fourth ferocious beast goes to war against the saints, against God's people for three and a half years, kills a lot of them. And God eventually saves those who remain and resurrects the rest and gives them rulership. But everything I read tells me the time coming just before Christ returns is going to be very, very rough. 
very perilous. Many of us will die, and God will allow it. There will be some who will be, by the way, if you die in strength, if you die praising God, what an honor that would be to die for him who died for us. It's not a shameful thing to die for God and not be in a place of safety. It's not. But if you're not in a place of safety, then you be a solid, strong witness, a martyr, you know, marturo, a martyr for a witness for God. I love Psalms, Psalms 119, 14, Psalm 119, 114, and, and Psalm 32, verse 7, that God is my hiding place. You are my hiding place. But many of God's children will first of all have to face the beast system uh, and a great false prophet, the great false prophet at the very end time, who will be in there in power for about three and a half years. Revelation 13, let's read that chapter. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast, that's a government, a kingdom, an empire, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, we already know the dragon is that Satan, gave him his power his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. So this world leader is going to almost be killed. It looks like he had been killed, but he's healed. The world marveled, followed the beast. Boy, this has got to be a sign. God's healed him. That's the way the world would look at it. And so they worshipped the dragon, that means they worshipped Satan, who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who's like the beast, who's able to make war with him? This beast was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. You can read about this in Daniel 7 as well. He was given authority to continue for 42 months, that's three and a half years. And then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. Against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Did you read that? Did you hear that? Verse 7. It was granted to this awful government power, military government power, the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him of every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, who, uh, uh, the, the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If you have an ear to hear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity will go into captivity and so on. Let's pick up verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The other one came out of the sea. This one will come out of the earth. And sometime we'll have to go through this in detail. And he had two horns like a lamb. Lamb, gentle, and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of that first beast in his presence. They work together, this military, political, economic power, combining now with a religious power, a great false prophet. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, causes all the earth who dwell in it, verse 12 here, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, this great false prophet, this second beast who looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. Verse 13, he performs great signs and he makes fire fall down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. We'll talk at length on that in the next sermon. That reminds you of Elijah, doesn't it? For fire from heaven? Doesn't that remind you of when God blessed the, tab the temple and blessed the tabernacle of Moses, temple of Solomon, and sent fire from heaven and a big cloud and everything? So fire from heaven. This isn't Elijah, folks. This isn't Moses. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image, 
to this economic military power who was wounded by the sword and lived. Apparently it was an assassination attempt or war or something and, 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 and survived it. The, the first piece, the economic one. This, this religious leader is granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. If that's a literal image or if that means something else, life comes to it. The image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, every single person, small and great, rich and poor, you and me, or we die, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one could do any business. You can't buy, you can't sell, unless you have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And the number, he says, is 666, the number of a man. Here's wisdom. So it goes on to say in verse 15, the end of it, let's look at that again. I have it underlined. Cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So your option is I'll take this mark. Now, some people are wondering, is the COVID passport that they're talking about, is that the mark of the beast? I don't think so. But I think it's setting the stage for that kind of thinking that we can make everybody do a certain thing. Whatever happened to my body, my, my, my rights, that the abortion issues, whatever happened to my body, my choice, whatever happened to that? All of a sudden, it's not my body, my choice, is it? So anyway, um, you're either going to die or be in a place of safety or go along with the beast system. If you go along with the beast system, in Revelation 14 and 15, especially 15, I think it is, it says those who go along with it, God's going to deal with them. You don't want to have God's wrath on you. You really don't. So why did I decide to give this sermon? Three major events have happened that have led me to give this sermon. The first one was how suddenly, how quickly, it seems, world events could change. There's a Wuhan virus, the China virus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. The whole world changed. Boom! Quickly. Economy shut down. Society shut down. You couldn't go have a wedding. You couldn't go have... My wife's mom died, and only 15 or so people, 12, 12 15 people were allowed, and only for 15 minutes. That was it. And weddings were put off. Kids couldn't go to school. Now, here in Florida, God thank us. God thank you for... We thank you for Governor DeSantis, who saw how stupid these things were, and he went and locked down pretty much the older people, especially in nursing homes, and kept everything else pretty much open. And our numbers are no worse, a lot better actually, than numbers you find, let's say, in California, Washington, Oregon, and, and uh, New York, if you go per 100,000. But anyway, my point is how suddenly everything could change. So we find out in Jesus, in Yeshua talking about it shall be in the, in the last days, shall be like in the days of Lot and the days of Noah. What he was focusing on there, though it was very, very evil time, of course, what he focused on was how suddenly everything changed. So COVID-19 crisis suddenly changed the world. Here in America, we had a booming economy. We had unemployment at record lows. Every sector of society, male, female, black, white, brown, uh, every, every sector of society was working, we're doing well, we're making more money. Our military was being rebuilt, the economy was booming, unemployment was way, way ahead. We were independent energy comp uh, country. We were producing and selling more energy than any other country. Can you imagine that now? Peace was coming to the Middle East. NATO has, had, to be, had to pay their bills. China was quiet. There are no new wars. And then COVID hits and everything changes. So I'm not talking about politics here, but the suddenness of how quickly things can change. And we better be ready. My point is I don't know that we'll have a lot of time to get a real deep relationship going with God and with Yeshua if we wait till the very last days. 
We're in the last days, but the very last hours or so. We've got to be doing it now. The second thing that prompted me, the first one was how suddenly things can change. The second thing that prompted me was how many of our countrymen were willing to give up and surrender their constitutional rights, right here in America especially. How suddenly we were convinced in this emergency, we have to give up freedom of religion. We have to give up freedom of, of speech. We have to give up freedom of assembly. We have to give up the free exercise of our religion. We have to give up our businesses that we put our whole life into. How quickly and how few really stood up against that. You and I are going to be faced with the same predicament soon in the years ahead. When Peter and the apostles were faced with, you guys have to shut down. You can't be preaching in this name anymore. You're making it look like we're the ones who killed this Jesus. No, no, you guys got to stop. And, and, and uh, that's the law now. That's, that's where the Sanhedrin, that's the law we have. Peter could have said, oh, really? Is that the law? Oh, dear. Okay, I guess I have to obey the law. God tells us we have to obey those in authority. So, guys, we have to go home until they say we can, we can assemble again. We'll have to cancel preaching about Christ. No, he didn't do that. Let's read what happened. Because you and I are going to have to do this at some point. I don't think we did very well the last time, except that church that used to be the uh, Ambassador Auditorium. Um, the leader of that church, an Asian pastor, uh, he stood up against California and after uh, much persecution, finally, finally won. Uh, most churches gave in. Acts 5, verses 17 to 21. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which are the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation against the apostles. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them into the common prison. But that night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, apparently without waking up the guards, and brought them out, told them, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I don't care what Sanhedrin said, that you must stop speaking. I don't care that you're locked down literally in a prison. When they heard it, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. When they entered the temple, we mean the temple compound, of course. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Okay, let's bring in those 12 now. But when the officers came, verse 22, they couldn't find them in prison. They returned and said, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, the guards standing outside in front of the doors. But when we opened them, nobody was inside. Well, no, the angel had brought them out. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the uh, temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and said, Hey, look, they're actually in the temple area preaching, teaching the people. And then the captain went out there, brought them back in, uh, not violently, less, without violence, verse 26, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, Did we not strictly command you to, not to teach in this name? Didn't we tell you to stop it? Why are you still doing it? And look, you've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Remember this story. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging him on a tree. Him God has exalted and put him on his right hand and so on. And then verse 40, they're, after being warned by Gamaliel, verse 40, the council agreed with Gamaliel, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, beaten them, God allowed it, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy, worthy to suffer, suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple, and in every house, they didn't cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's what they did. 
when government said, stop it, put teaching in this man's name, lock down, we must obey God rather than men. There are going to be things you're going to be told to do, and you're going to have to say, I have to obey God rather than men, whether you beat me or put me in prison or kill me. We have to be praying to have that kind of relationship with God, to have faith that we could do that. Point number three. Then there was this. To me, this was the last straw. How many believers were deceived, to some degree, some much more than others, about what would happen to the newly elected president, of President Biden? In January 2021, some said to February, some said to March, some said to April that he would be unceremoniously removed. There were people who were writing and saying that that wasn't even the real President Biden. He was an actor playing the part. And they showed this and that reason why. He's not flying in Air Force One. Well, he did fly in Air Force One. He is flying in Air Force One. So too many conservatives found themselves putting too much trust in Trump, in a man. I guess conservatives preferred his conservative views. I didn't like his womanizing, his roughness, his the way he would insult people. Didn't like a lot. But his conservative values, standing up for flag and country and our military and, and the nuclear family, standing up for who we are as a people. But prior to the election, there were many ministers who actually got up and claimed on TV, on YouTube, that they had had dreams and visions, many of them. Sid Roth on his It's, Nat it's Supernatural show on TV had many ministers there claiming God spoke to them that Trump would be elected. No question. And too many of us believe that. Too many of God's children spent spe precious hours beyond that than listening to conspiracy theories about what was really going down, what was really going on, and some just kept believing and believing and believing this. That is deception. That is being deceived. We gave them way too much credence, wasted too much of our time. Most of the ones I know repented of that and want to be sure it doesn't happen again. But it was a wake-up call how easily so many believed a lie, a deception. Those ministers' prophecies didn't come to pass. They were false prophets. I hope, now this is a difference between saying you hope for a re-election or you hope for this or you prefer that or this. And uh, it looks like it might be this. Or that, that's one thing. But to say, God spoke to me. God gave me this vision. There are some very detailed visions by some men. Sad. But they were false prophets. Let's acknowledge it. Let's not make that mistake again. And that's why I'm giving this sermon and the next. Spend your time in God's word, not on these theories. So many conservatives believed there would be a true insurrection. I don't mean the January 6th one, but one involving the military and taking out, it's just awful. Those of us believers who believed any of that, for that kind of thing, were deceived. Any believers who believe that stuff were deceived. If you still believe it, you really are deceived. So it made me realize we're not as strong spiritually as many of us might have hoped. We got deceived. It should be a trial run, a practice run, to keep us from having that ever happen again. It's a lesson. If we don't learn from this, when the beast and that great false prophet come on the scene, we might very well be deceived again. So make no mistake, Satan is your adversary. He's your enemy. He's setting up the foundation of all the things to be in place to go after believers. 
to have a, a history, a precedent of locking people up if they don't do the right thing, say the right thing. So God is clear. If we become a part of that system, though, we will share in its plagues. I'll end with that. I was going to summarize it all. I'll just say this. So Satan's deceived the whole world. The first word deception or deceived was used is in Genesis 3. Eve was deceived, even though she knew the truth, had the truth, said the truth to, to Satan, she was still deceived. She let him lead her along. We must not let that happen to us. Even knowing the truth is not enough unless we act on it and believe it and obey it. How many believers were deceived, again, like I said, into believing these conspiracy theories? I'm talking about so many people I know. And I hoped for those things, that some of it would be true. I didn't believe the removal of a president. I didn't believe that. I didn't hope for that. But so many did. So till next time, we'll learn more next time about how to be sure you're not deceived. Put a lot of thought into it. Father in heaven, we just come before your holy throne and we just raise holy hands to you and we ask you in Yeshua's mighty name, please, dear God, please, dear God, fill us with your Holy Spirit, fill us with your word, fill us with truth, fill us with conviction to follow you no matter what. Help us not ever be deceived by Satan or by his minions. Shine upon us. Put your word into our hearts. Put your spirit into our bodies. Come and live in us. Have free run of our lives. Have free run of the house that we give you. And we just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name that you pour your Holy Spirit out on your people stronger than ever before and let us be strong for you. Watch over us. Protect us. We thank you, bless you, and we praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.